Uh, coming on, Tim Faulkner from EcoRI. Tim, you in the house? I'm here. Hey, Josh. Great. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Hey, you get over here on the, the big red. red. The big. What you viewers can't see is there's this special mark on the floor for all our superstar guests. Uh, Tim, uh, it's a very interesting time in Rhode Island on the issue of, of energy and on the environment. Those two issues are always intertwined. Um, one of the issues that that probably isn't getting enough attention. You guys have done a remarkably good job covering it. I think everybody else in the media, including ourselves, has completely dropped the ball, all to your win uh, accordingly, is this power plant proposed for uh, Burrowville and uh, how it's being looked at by the state of Rhode Island and the Energy Siting Council. And uh, opponents had a new appeal, uh, right. which looked like a good appeal, which should have gotten some level of response and action. and, and Talk a little bit about what's going on at the Energy Siting Council. You know, last week or maybe a week and a half ago, the Siting Board, which has three members on it, they denied a number of appeals from the Town of Burrowville and the Conservation Law Foundation, They're probably the two most active in opposing the power plant. And um, they, you know, they're trying to really do what they can to kind of come up with some innovative ways to maybe delay the process and maybe get Invenergy, the developer, to sort of get tired of the whole process and maybe walk away. They figure the longer they can draw this out, the better the case will be for them. So they brought up a, um, some interesting cases about, you know, whether or not the, um, you know, the, the applications was complete. You know, there's a lot of missing information, and so they had to really kind of go through all that. And ultimately, the siting board sided with Invenergy. And uh, the next big step is that October 15th is going to be a public hearing in, in Burrowville High School for all, you know, anyone in the community to come and, you know, kind of voice their last minute um, support or concerns for the project. And then at the end of October, there's going to be a whole series over the course of several weeks of um, testimony from witnesses and experts. And so in the, in, in the olden yeah. days before the Energy Siting Council, if your, if your application wasn't complete and they would identify if it was complete or not complete. Right. You didn't go forward. The hearings didn't continue. It had to be complete. Now, it could change as the hearing process or additional information, but, the, the you know, you had to check off the boxes. So is there a real void in how diligent the Energy Siting Council is being right now in your estimation, seeing it all play out? You probably see it as, as, as well as anybody. Are they, are they holding Invenergy uh, to the standards or or is this just a natural process? That's really hard to say because these applications are so few and far between. I mean, I think the last one was maybe 15 to 20 years ago. So you have all new members on the board. And again, it's a small board deciding this, which is one point of criticism, right? It's, it's always been that way. It's always right. been a three-member board. Right. Who's on the board right now? So you have the commissioner who's the head of the Public Utilities Commission, and that's Margaret Curran. Right. So she serves you know, on, as the head of the EFSB and the PUC. Um, and then it's the head of the Division of Planning and the head of the Department of Environmental Management. So the three of them will all serve on the board. And um, yeah, so really could get moved one way or another pretty quickly if they you know, find something that is incomplete about the application or that maybe just doesn't meet the standards of what they're looking for. But the standards aren't really that rigorous from what I've seen. It's really just whether or not it can be sort of an economic benefit, uh, whether the energy is needed. Those are really the two big things. And if those are fulfilled, you know, there's a good chance it could get approved. This event uh, in mid-October right. has the uh, potential to be, uh, I can't use the language on the air, just a big... <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it this way, we may broadcast live from right. there, right? right? It has the potential to be that. Yeah, definitely. Because I mean, yeah. this will be big. And they've had some really, you know, as you know, they've had some big contentious ones so far. The governor came down to Burville, up to Burville. Um, at the high school for an event, and that was very really raucous and, and long. And um, this will be the same thing, because I know that everyone realizes this is their last chance to really voice their opinions, and so they're going to do it. And the population of Burrowville, it's a big project, 60-something acres, promised to be seven or 800 construction jobs, 100 or 200 ongoing jobs, uh, major investment, the biggest economic development investment ever in the town of Burrowville. I'm sure they'll be the biggest taxpayer ever in the town of Burrowville. How does the town split up there on this? I think that there's, it, most people are against it. I mean, yeah. they've really... The, Is this a 90-10 or a 60-40? It's hard to tell. I mean, there's definitely a, 
I mean, if it's a, if they're a vocal minority, they're a pretty big minority. Yeah. I haven't seen. I've been to every hearing just about, and I have come across really just a few people that are maybe in the construction industry or the, with members of the union that are supporting it. But other than that, I, I would say, you know, the average resident who's pretty up to date on that, you know, what's going on in the community is, is against this project. And what's the dynamic? I mean, uh, uh, Energy Siting uh, Council makes a decision that is appealable. It is appealable, right. So, you know, they've had these hearings or sort of this whole application process has gone on for over almost two years. And any process, you know, that maybe is they find object objectionable either side, either of energy or the town, um, they can appeal it after the final decision, which is expected maybe in February or March. And that goes to the Superior Court or to the Supremes? Uh, that's a good question. I do not know. I don't know where it goes. So uh, you're right. I mean, in the in the early 1990s, I was assistant director at DEM. We had a number of big, big projects: uh, waste to energy plans, coal burning plant over in East Providence, and these were big fights, big, big fights, and very contentious. This is really the first big, first time somebody's wanted to come into Rhode Island and try and push one of these th these things through. The governor's been sort of all over on this, mm -hmm. right? She. she embraced them wildly when they came into town and, and photo opted with them, announced that this was a good green policy company right. and that $700 million investment was good to the state. Then Boroughville residents reacted uh, pretty negatively. She's backed off that and her mantra now is let the process prevail. Is that where she right. is? Yeah, I think she was there at the big launch they had, um, I think at the, um, was it the, uh, Oh, it was downtown province. Anyway, they had a big, a big launch, and everybody there from Energy, and um, she was a very vocal supporter of the project at the time. But I think a couple of things. I mean, you know, uh, in addition to the town having really such strong pushback against it, the belief at that time that not wasn't questioned a lot was that natural gas was a bridge fuel, and I think now the research is starting to show that a there's going to be enough energy efficiency and renewable energy that's coming online that that's maybe it's not needed and then also that natural gas is probably a lot more polluting and harmful than the environment that people thought. The other politician who's been sort of caught in the fray is, uh, you know, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, mm -hmm. uh, very, very strong proponent at the national and global level, gives a speech every week on the United States Senate floor, speaking to his colleagues about the importance of global warming, uh, but he's been a little MIA on this right. one, and I think you guys, and I think we've also called him out on uh, some inconsistencies on that. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Is he just literally hiding under his bed, hoping that this will go away? Yeah, I mean, I think he he initially used the bridge fuel response. He was probably the biggest proponent of that a couple of years ago, saying that you know the nat natural gas and the expansion of natural gas pipelines, which is also going on in southern New England, was um, was acceptable. And now I think, as again, as the research is showing, and I think he's believing more and more that it's not, it's really harmful, there's a lot less time than we have. So, you know, is he also worried about, uh, it's an election cycle, yeah. he's looking like he may have a very, very significant opponent uh, in former Supreme Court Justice Bob Flanders is making some noise that he might run. Is he also want to make sure that he's doubling down on his labor support yeah, and absolutely. doesn't want to alienate them? Can't have it both ways on this project though. Yeah, I think that's hard. He, he, you know, he's he's definitely sitting on that fence. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's the labors is probably the biggest reason. Um, you guys had a great piece uh, on the issue of spraying, and that who's in charge of overseeing spraying? What is spring? You mean what? The uh, for um, uh, mosquitoes and otherwise. Uh, oh, okay. For the, um, uh, for pesticides yeah. and things like that. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It's um, no one's in charge. No one's in charge. Yeah, and we've written about this a couple of times in the past few years, and you, you maybe you get a little bit of an answer about what's being sprayed at a certain point, but as far as the state has for a policy and for what's being done and how much they use, there's, they're not telling us. So should that be? Is that an environmental? I mean, is that a statutory need that there needs to be at, no, at least, if nothing else, some kind of database so people can understand? who's spraying, when they're spraying, there's public health issues tied to this. 
regardless for certain folks with asthma and otherwise mm -hmm. need to be knowledgeable about when they're spraying and, and who's responsible for it. Yeah. Is, that a, is that a missing component to the regulatory framework? Well, of I think the rules are there and it's just like a lot of other rules that um, in the environmental community, there's just no enforcement of it. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the ones I was just looking at in today is that every school in Rhode Island, private or public, if they you know spray pesticides, they have to either A, um, create an option when they let parents know if they want to know when it happens. Um, they've got to put up signage and let people know ahead of time, but none of them do it. I don't know anything that, that, that do do that regularly or, or offer that kind of database. So the information's there. I think the regulations are there. I think as far as the enforcement and sort of bringing together the technology and putting it online, which I think they could do easily enough, that's not happening. Um, other issues, legislature finally closed down, right? right? Uh, it was kind of a milk toast year for the environmental community. Yeah, it was. You know, it was a strong year for renewable energy. Yeah, there are a lot of programs, a lot of the incentive programs that they have for wind and solar and other stuff, but mostly wind and solar. Those were expanded or extended. Um, and that was good. So that's just going to create some uh, more market. Yeah, more market. It's and so. I wrote this week about how you know, solar energy is doing really well. The prices are all coming down, so it's a it's a really good. That was a good piece. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's if you look at it as a lot of I think people that do go with solar energy, especially residential, as they look at it, it's more comparing it to investment. You know, like mm -hmm. a CD, what's the return you're going to get on your right. money? And you know, the numbers are pretty steady. You know, you're going to really do much better than you might do if you've got, and not everybody does, but if you've got ten or twenty thousand dollars that you want to invest in a good solar system. You're probably going to do a lot better in putting up panels on your house than you would be trying to invest it anywhere else. Um, but there were some other bills in the General Assembly. I didn't really pay attention. All of a sudden, I'm like, wow, all these bills last week were suddenly kind of popping up again. And uh, there were a couple that, that passed this week that were significant. Um, one of them is, and this is a bill they've been trying to pass for a few years, is getting a lot of the bad chemicals out of upholstery and uh, furniture and children's clothing and you know, children's toys. Yeah. So they, pa they finally passed it this week was um, uh, you know, a law that requires that all that stuff can no longer have things like formaldehyde and other toxic chemicals. So that's a, you know, I think that's a big win. I'm not sure how all that's going to get enacted, but that was a pretty significant bill that I... I, I Is that being really passed good. regionally, too? So it's sort of a model bill that they're looking to pass in multiple states. It's hard for Rhode Island to pass a bill like that unilaterally because China doesn't care. They just won't bring the furniture here, and North Carolina doesn't care. Uh, usually, coalition Northeast governors or the New England Governors Association push forward those. I don't know if you're right. Yeah, I'm not. I, I haven't followed it as closely this week. I know every state usually, or most of the states in New England, you know, introduce and yeah. have bills like this that they're debating. And I'm not sure if there's a clause in there, like on others, where if Massachusetts or Connecticut does it, they will do it. Um, I probably I would guess that there is because you know how do you just you know do it in Rhode Island so much well, one one interesting thing there. that's going on which I've never seen before so they in the real estate market prices are exploding yeah. inventory is declining but there's not a big big building explosion mm -hmm. in Rhode Island right now is that going to turn and is there going to be then uh, you know new housing starts is not it's not a hugely growing category is that going to turn at some point and put a lot more pressure on open space in Rhode Island? That's one uh, we, Frank and I, you know, uh, Frank, the editor of Eco RI News, um, we've all been sort of working and nibbling around the edges of. You know, it's a question of, you know, are we out of room? You yeah. know, is it? Uh, are we built out? I mean, obviously, there's a lot more rural communities to the south and the north, northwest uh, of the state. Um, where there's a lot more open space where they can do it. That could be part of it, you know, just running out of the space of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in a lot of the suburban communities, they're certainly very well built out. I live down in the East Bay, and there's very little land. I can yeah. see where they're building on any spot they oh can find. Oh, my God, it's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> so I think as far as, like, you know, the huge subdivisions, those those days are probably coming and gone. I mean, they're seeing probably more down by... I would see a few down by, by URI and down in South Carolina. Even further, Exeter and down right. in there. Um, the, the market on the east side of Providence, the house goes on the market in the morning, it's gone by the end of the I mean, it right. literally is gone by the end of the day. It's uh, really exploding. And, it, you know, we already have a housing affordability pro problem. Uh, yeah. This is not, uh, not helping it particularly. Um, anything else we should know? Anything we didn't cover? No, I mean, I think the, the power plant's going to probably be dominating um, the news 
you know, for the next um, next month, I would imagine there's going to be some filings and appeals and things like that. Um, and let's see, what else are we writing about? We, we always, I've got something I'm working on uh, regarding pesticides and, um, you know, trying to use maybe organic or healthy alternatives, some of the things that you can do for that. Right. Um, but yeah, there's all, you know, as you know in the news business, it doesn't, you know, if the business is, if it's slow, it doesn't last long. No, no, about seven minutes. You're right. Um, I want to thank you as always. It's a great partnership. I think it's a huge, uh, EcoRI just does an amazingly strong job in reporting on uh, really critical issues of public health and the environment. We appreciate it every week having you guys on and being partners with you.